Hi everyone, this is a video about the speed of sound lab and in this video we're going to walk through the analysis of method one where you change the location of the microphone in relation to the tube in which the standing wave of the sound existed. So to begin talking about this particular analysis, I'd like to remind you that when we had the tube, inside the tube there was a sound wave it looked something like that. And of course, it's a longitudinal wave, not a transverse wave in the case of sound. And as you move that microphone back and forth, you found the locations of the nodes, which were where the wave amplitude equaled zero. And you should have taken note at as to the location of each of these nodes on the little ruler that existed down below the tube itself. And uh, you would have recorded the positions of the microphone at each one of those nodes. Okay, so skipping ahead here, I've put all of those locations of the nodes into a spreadsheet, into a column, and the units are centimeters, and uh, over here in this column, I'm going to write down delta x node, which is going to be the distance from a given node to the one previously. So since there was no node previous to that one, I'll just leave that blank. But this one becomes 3.41. That's the distance from that node to the previous one. And the next one becomes 2.89 and this one becomes 3.59 and then we just do that for all the nodes that we found using this method okay and then we're going to calculate the average of all of these and we can call that delta x node average where the average is the line over the variable like that so that corresponds to the average distance between any two of these nodes here. And hopefully you recognize that for every wavelength, we have two of those spans. So therefore we can say that our wavelength, which is typically represented with the symbol lambda, Greek letter lambda, equals two times delta x node average. So let's say that I computed that average and it turned out to be 3.02 centimeters, the average distance between the nodes. Then I multiply that times two, that means that my wavelength is going to equal 6.04 centimeters. Now the next step is to look at the frequency that we were measuring these nodes at. And so let's just say for our purpose that I was measuring the frequency at 3.592 kilohertz. That's what the function generator said on the side. Now remember that one hertz is equal to one inverse second. And that one kilohertz is equal to a thousand hertz. And so I can convert this to inverse seconds by just multiplying times a thousand. So I get 3.592 times 10 to the third inverse seconds. That's my frequency. And while I'm at it, I may as well also convert my wavelength to meters because we want to do our analysis using standard units. So this becomes 6.04 times 10 to the negative 2 meters for the wavelength. So now we're going to use all these numbers to calculate the speed of the wave or the velocity of the wave, which I'll just use the symbol Vs to represent. And that's going to equal the wavelength times the frequency. Why is that? Hopefully you see right away that the units work out. If I multiply a wavelength times a frequency, I get units of meters per second, which is the units for velocity, but why specifically 
does uh, that formula work? Well, one way I like to think about it is that lambda represents the length that the wave goes per cycle. And then the frequency represents how many cycles does the wave go around per time. And so if the wave goes through a certain number of cycles per unit of time, and then it goes through a certain length for every cycle, hopefully you can see how just multiplying those two numbers times each other will give you the length that the wave travels per unit of time. Okay, and then if you go and you look in your protocol, you can find the following equation. This is equation 15, where this here is the speed of sound, and then remember this gamma is equal to CPM divided by CVM. And then, of course, R is the gas constant, T is temperature. And then this is big M. This is going to be the molar mass of the gas in which the sound is moving. So what we want to calculate from all this is we want to calculate gamma. Because we know Vs, we know these other variables. So we need to isolate gamma with respect to these other variables. So I'm going to square both sides of this equation, and I get Vs squared equals gamma RT over M. And if you want to take a stab at figuring this out algebraically, go ahead and pause and do so, but I'll just tell you the answer. Gamma is going to be equal to the molar mass volume squared divided by RT. And then we're going to use that value for the next stage of the analysis. One more note that I almost forgot. This R you're going to want to use the value of R that's in joules per Kelvin mole. And the Kelvin's going to cancel out with the temperature. And, uh, oh, yeah, quick side note, that temperature you measured in the lab. You'll need to have used the thermometer that was right there next to the um, oscilloscope in order to measure that temperature, and then you'll use that in Kelvin. And then your molar mass uh, is going to need to be in kilograms per mole. So you'll need to calculate the molar mass of the gas in kilograms per mole, not grams per mole. And that's because one joule of energy is equal to one kilogram meter squared per second squared. And that's what's going to cancel out with the kilogram in the molar mass. And it's also the meter squared second squared is going to cancel out with the speed squared up on the numerator of that equation.